Hi, and welcome to Fresh Waves. I'm your host, Bren Masson. This is another one of our organ donation awareness shows that we're running for the entire month of April. And today, we're really happy to have on board with us Jean-Paul Bernier. Good morning, Jean-Paul. Good morning. Well, welcome to Fresh Waves. You're new to the show. We have many guests during this um, organ donation awareness time that we have interviewed several times over. And one of my guests, Melody Clausen, uh, she was actually our our show that kicked off the season. She said, you've got to talk to Jean-Paul. And I said, OK, <laughs> so here we are talking to you. You are a heart transplant recipient. And yes, that means that you're walking around with someone else's heart who's no longer using it so you get to use it which is an amazing thing tell us how this all happened well i'll, I'll give you a, a bit of a rundown of the medical history um march 17 2003 i was 45 years old i was still playing competitive level volleyball in uh, montreal a tournament here in montreal and um top of my top shape physically um I went to the gym every day, and I started having pains in my chest, but I thought it might have been, like, uh, indigestion or whatever. So I literally drove back to Toronto and slept overnight with this pain the entire time. And in the morning, I finally went to the hospital, and they had the leads on me for, like, 30 seconds and ripped everything off of me and zipped me under University Avenue to Toronto General so they could – put a stent in my aorta. I had a blockage Mm -hmm. in my aorta. And um, as a result of me waiting and not doing anything, so folks do something if something like this happens, um, one half to one third of my heart was destroyed and it would never come back. Wow. I know. So you know what? Put your head down and nose to the grindstone and keep going. So I went to the physio and everything, uh, went back to work, Continued to go to the gym, uh, walking, etc. Although, like, you know, I, I would get out of breath very easily, like walking up these steps to this gothic building that I worked in. By the time I got to the top, I was winded. But it is what it is. And, you know, um, I was very fortunate. Uh, my cardiologist, uh, Heather Ross, who is now the director of UHN in Toronto, actually took me on board, thank God, because it's hard to find a good team. And I've got a shout out to Toronto General and the Peter Monk Cardiac Centre, that tower. Um, they are the fourth top hospital in the world, a publicly funded hospital, the fourth top hospital in the world for heart transplants. And uh, they're just phenomenal. But um, anyways, um, 2005, I developed arrhythmia. Um, and so I had to have a defibrillator implanted, which was a lot of fun because, you know, you're going to the gym and when you feel an attack coming on your, your skin flushes because, you know, your blood's trying to get to the surface to get some oxygen, but that's also how, how it feels before the device fires. (laughs) (laughs) So, (laughs) you know, and, and the technology, they replaced that defibrillator once, uh, there was more uh, there. There were um, prim- parameters on the defibrillator that they could set it so that you know you had to trust the science and keep going. But as uh, 2017, 18 came along, the defibrillator kept firing more and more often. The arrhythmia was getting worse and worse. So I, they kept uh, modifying the parameters on the device. They kept. Uh, modifying my medications and so I went in on September 18th 2018 for what I thought would be a regular checkup and um, Heather looks at me and she says uh, no you're staying here you're not going home uh, you've got to stay in the hospital we've got to put you on milnerone which is a steroid steroid so I had a, a pick in my arm an IV for six months while I waited in the hospital wow I know uh, but you know what? Again, such we're so lucky. Um, they have telemetry packs, so you can be mobile the entire time. 
uh, they're giving you this Milton Road. I felt like a 21 year old and, and they <laughs> stressed with you. Of course, there's this whole barrage of tests that they have to put you through. And sometimes it takes six months for those tests. They did two weeks and they have to eliminate things like, are you possibility of getting cancer? What, what are your kidneys like? What do your organs look like? Kidneys, uh, liver, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they eliminate everything. And then yes, you find to get on the list. So they got me on the list. And, um, I had this IV in my hand and my, my dancing partner, this IV pole, and I would literally walk in the hospital 10,000 steps a day. They put an exercise bike outside my room. So I was on the exercise bike and I was exercising with surgical tubing, um, to keep myself in good physical condition because a, they can't operate on you unless you're in good physical condition. B, when they do do the transplant and you're in good physical condition, you'll, you'll bounce back much, much quicker. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so it was, um, it was, I also worked on the psychological part as well. I did a lot of, I, I never thought that I would buy into this, but I did a lot of, uh, deep breathing and meditation. Um, exercises and um, just sort of worked on my mental health well-being as well Mm -hmm. which was difficult shout out to primary caregivers my husband who is the most wonderful man literally came to see me every day at the hospital and continued to work and that keeping care of the house and our dog he was just phenomenal um i know and I don't think, and put up with me and my pouting and feeling sorry for myself and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, well, um, you were in the hospital for a long time. That's understandable. I was there for, <laughs> from September 18th until March, well, March 9th, wow. 2019. At 1.19.09 in the morning, they wheeled me in for the transplant. Wow. I now, know. did they tell you a couple of days in advance or anything that... No, that, because they, 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 the... The catchment area, from what I understand, is from um, is is the entire country. I think as far as Alberta, so this heart can come in from anywhere in the world, uh, right. anywhere in Canada. And thank God that uh, I there there's often what they call false alarms. So I did, I think maybe in December, have a false alarm where they said they had a heart for me. And of course, they, it's a major operation. So they got you down there like four or five hours beforehand, prepping you, <clears throat> you know, uh, giving you IVs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, what happened was at 1030, the phone rang and I just knew in my heart that it was a false alarm. That, that turned out that I had antigens that people normally who've had blood transfusions would have, but I never had a blood transfusion. But oh, apparently it, these antigens occur in 30% of the population. Hmm. So I guess their numbers people started crunching some numbers and they're it's such an incredible hospital. They said, no, you know what? We're not going to wor- worry about complications, et cetera, later for not getting you the right heart. You can, we're going to wait for the right heart for you. So again, it's so December to March. And you know, they come and check with me. They had psychologists come in and check with you. How are you doing? Blah, blah, blah. Um, and then finally in March, the call came through and, um, you know, they brought me down. And of course, I'm, they're prepping me and the anesthesiologist says, well, you're not very, very excited. And they said, I don't want to get excited because I'm afraid that it might be another false alarm. Mm-hmm. So uh, their team at TGH actually saw the heart, approved it, and it was a go. And with the criteria for a heart transplant is because I'm a tall person, it had to have been a larger heart because it has to pump to the extremities. Uh And also, um, of course, blood type. Fortunately, I was a blood type that was... um, pretty receptive uh there was a friend of mine larry who was in there i think he was type o which means he can he can donate a heart to anybody but he can only get a heart from another type o oh that's tricky i know but he got his before mine and thank god so um so yeah so it was um 
And then when they do the operation, it takes about five, six hours. At one nineteen oh nine in the morning, these this whole team is there working on you. Uh, they've got a – when I woke up uh, – in, um, I guess, intensive care or IC or a uh, very, very high intensive care. They had me on, um, they gave me some morphine initially, but I really hated it because every, all the lights were blurry and everything. So I managed to just go with extra strength Tylenol. Uh, but I still had a, a black box, which was a, an exterior defibrillator coming out of me with wires. No, oh my. <laughs> and so, what they have to do, and one of the reasons why you have to be in such good shape is they literally, in order to get the heart out of you, they've got to cut down your breastbone, yep. open you up, take out the defective heart, which I donated, by the way, and put the new heart in. And then they wire you up, and the actual scar, I, the scarring is like hardly noticeable. They didn't, they didn't use staples. They didn't use... They didn't stitch me up. They used glue. It was phenomenal. Oh, weird. I know. But uh, thank God he did all those exercises because the worst part was like sitting up in bed. <laughs> oh, mm-hmm. my goodness. So um, I I was, I was recovered pretty quickly. They, they moved me from the intensive care unit down to a recovery unit uh, in about two or three, two days. And oh. on the third day, I was walking around in the hallways without a cane. And without a walker. Wow. Yeah. That's so incredible. there were some bumps in the road. Uh, when you normally have, when you have a transplant, sometimes there's rejections. They're constantly checking, like one week, two weeks. And, you know, as you have success. And, of course, I had some rejection at the at the front end. Um, one, the therapy that they use for transplants patients is what they call rejection therapy. So... Basically, they're giving you immune system suppression drugs so that your body will not reject the organ. Now, apparently, I was joking with one of the cardiologists. They are working on uh, acceptance. So somehow discovering some drug or medication that they can give you that encourages your body to accept the organ. But this, at this moment, that's what they work with, rejection therapy to and I'm still, I will be probably on uh, immune system suppression drugs for the rest of my life yeah. so that it will not reject the organ. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, so there were some, there was some rejection, uh, two, two rejections at the beginning. And what they did was they gave you um, huge mass, masses of steroids. Um, and, of course, it really knocks the heck out of you. Yeah, it does. and I I did have to go in. I think two. I had fell at home going up the steps, so I did have to go to uh, a, a rehab hospital in, in Toronto for about um, two or three days. No, probably four or five days. Uh, interesting. The hospital had those rubberized floors, so if you fell, you wouldn't hurt yourself. That's nice. But one of the things that I think they should do is teach a patient, especially older people, teach them how to fall. Yes. <laughs> I was teach reading them how an article to fall about, and how to walk. <laughs> well, they, yeah, but I was reading an article about that. They, like, you know, they're, they are doing that now. They're teaching elderly people and I guess patients who are recovering from surgery or whatever how to fall. Mm-hmm. And exactly. And they're, so, and that case, so now I'm 100%. I've transferred now to the Montreal Heart Institute here. Uh, I went back to work after uh, my transplant um, because it was during COVID and uh, the schools that I worked with had, had not had their their actual commencement ceremony or graduation or certificates or uh, scholarships, nothing for like two years. Yeah. So that's my baby. I sit on the committee, the transplant, uh, sorry, the uh, Scholarship committee. I also am the administrator of the office administrator for the school, and I know a lot of the benefactors. So uh, actually, the board was very nice. I contacted and said, "Look, you know, we haven't collected these monies for scholarships, but they're there, and the kids deserve this." So we actually, I put together uh, simultaneously two graduations wow. and uh, managed to. Um, 
get the right person to replace me as far as my job is concerned. And uh, then in July of last year, I thought, this is it. Like, it's time to start living. And I retired, sold house in Toronto, and moved to Montreal and um, bought a beautiful condo and go to the gym every day. And I'm right across from this gorgeous park and I'm traveling and the world is my oyster. Wow. Now, do you think that would have happened if you had not gone through everything that you've gone through? No, I probably would have worked to like 70, 75. I'm just like, I'm, I'm a, I'm from farm country. I'm a farm kid, right? So like basically it's that damn Protestant work ethic. Yeah. <laughs> be like if work is, it's, is your life. And then you sort of like when you, when you go through all of this, you realize that it's, it's, you know, they're going to replace you. You're not irreplaceable and things will not fall apart when you leave. You know, you're, it, things will be just fine. So, um, and, and like, you know, you're spending half of your waking time. And I, I loved my job. I loved my work. I loved the people that I worked with. I and loved, what did you do exactly? I was the office administrator at a large uh, collegiate technical institute. Mm-hmm. Um, and I love kids. Um, love to see them succeed and become the best that they can. Um, so, yeah, it was... Um, that was hard to walk away from, but on the other hand, boy, you know, the, a door closed, but tons of windows have opened. So now I'm sort of sitting here going, hmm, I got to start volunteering and giving something back here. So there are numerous organizations in Montreal that I'm interested in getting involved with. Um, there's, uh, one organization de- deals with street youth. Nice. Um, out on the street. I don't know how good I would be sitting down and talking to these kids, but I, I know that I'm damn good at raising money. <laughs> yeah, well, so I, <laughs> you do what you're good at, right? <laughs> exactly. I mean, so, maybe there's some um, patient advocacy, too, that you could get involved in, because I was just talking to a woman who um, does that for the Kidney Foundation of Canada, and it's it's quite a rewarding thing. I mean... I'm I'm talking to you now because Melody Klassen said you got to call JP, so I did, and I'm really happy to speak with you and hear what you've gone through. And I, I was talking to Melody about the fact that so many of the transplant patients that I speak with are so inspiring, and we laugh because she and I both agree that she didn't really want to be this inspiring, but. <laughs> <laughs> But given the situation is what it is, when you've been in a situation where life has been taken from you or so many of the things that we all take for granted has been taken away and then you're given this new lease on life by a transplant, you treat the world differently. You walk through this world differently than when you started out. Well, I can guarantee you. On a day, sunshiny day, cloudy day, if there's some person walking down the sidewalk with a big smile on their face, that person is probably a transplant patient. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and you just sort of like, what, I used to get upset about things, water runs off my back. Now, it's sort of like, you know what I mean? It's it, case of raw, raw, what it is, it is what it is. I did like, I'm glad that you mentioned about patient advocacy because one of the things that they set up through TGH, which is just phenomenal, is they get, they set you up with a mentor. So my mentor, his name was Randy Mulrooney, uh, and he'd gone through a transplant and he walks you through it. He tells you, he's the one that told me, make sure you do your abdominal exercises because I'm telling you, when you go to sit up, it's going to hurt. <laughs> Yeah. So, and you know, and he's the one who sort of like, uh, sort sort of took me and shook me and said, "Look, be grateful, be more grateful, right?" And I'm going, "He's right," you know what I mean? So he's uh, he's really quite a wonderful man. Mm -hmm. And I think we all um, need that. It also makes you feel like you're not alone. Well, exactly. Um, And the the other, you know, when you're 
in that time that you're waiting in the hospital, I'd be walking around the ward and I've had a pretty full life. Like I was 63 when I had the transplant, 64. Um, there were young fellas in there. I saw a father younger than me walking around with his son with, with like pulling an oxygen cart with tubes in him and everything. And he's just withering away. And it's like, you know, you're, your heart breaks. It's like, and there are people who have congenital heart disease. They've been in and out their entire lives. So like you don't, you know, I'm very fortunate. I feel very fortunate, but you know, I sure as heck didn't feel sorry for myself, you know, especially seeing what other people were going through. So, and, and their courage, there was, uh, their, their courage is just so inspiring. Mm hmm. Well, I think that's, that's part of it is the courage that it takes to, to go on and the gratitude for whoever it was that had signed their donor card or gone to be a donor.ca and mm-hmm. said, when I'm no longer using these organs, heaven doesn't need my organs. They need them down here. And whoever wants them, take them, use them well, exactly. to their fullest. And that's why, you know, I don't want to get political about this, but I got so upset with the, the government in Ontario, especially the Minister of Health at that time, because she said, we don't want to go for this, I believe it's called an opt-in system. When you go to get your license or renew mm-hmm. your license, there's yep. a page and it, you automatically are uh, 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 become an organ donor. You can flip to the next page and opt out if you want. Mm-hmm. But everybody is opted in. But at least it sort of raises that issue to them that, hey, you could opt in versus not even touching on the subject whatsoever. And, you know, honestly, her argument was, well, it could lead to problems with the family, et cetera, et cetera. Well, if they're on it, like I know these people in, in, the, in, in the medical profession, if there's a problem with the family, you're not going to force that issue. No, of course not. They'll just move on. You know what I mean? Like it's. Yep. No, I know exactly what you mean. And I, I agree a hundred percent with the opt in program. And I think Ontario should be seriously looking at it. They say because we have such a high um, immigrant population, especially in the GTHA, that this is where the problem comes from is that some people are not going to understand what opting in means. And I say to that, I just say, well, let's get some education going. Mm -hmm. Let's up the education and start it in high school. Kids in high school, look at the Logan Boulay effect. Logan had a conversation with his dad when he was in high school because Mm -hmm. his coach had been an organ donor and died. And this is a, this is a student with the humble, hope of humble Broncos, right? Yes. And he, and Logan said to his dad, I want to donate my organ should anything happen to me. And his dad kept saying, I don't want to talk about this. Just no, no, no. Yeah, sure. When you're 110, we'll have this conversation, but I don't want to talk about it right now. And then unfortunately, Logan passed away in the Humboldt crash, but his dad knew loud and clear what his intentions were. Well, a wonderful young man, and the and, and donation spiked after that. Yes. Uh, but I have a friend in Toronto, uh, and she's a Saskatchewan farm girl, too, and uh, she'd actually gone out to visit family when I was in the hospital waiting for my transplant. And when she came back, she gave me one of those green armbands, green armbands uh, with the yeah, printed in yellow humble Broncos mm-hmm. for organ donation. So it was like, wow. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, yeah, he was yeah, it's just phenomenal. Yeah, a total but, inspiration. Know, yeah, and there are t- uh, I've, I've, I've noticed when I've gone in for my checkups, etc. Uh, there are a lot of living donors now too, especially with things like kidneys, um, and livers, etc. Yeah, so like that's something that people should think about as well: becoming living donors. Mm-hmm. Yep. Well, we're going to take our first little break here, and when we come back, we'll continue our conversation with Jean-Paul Bernier, who is a heart recipient, and um, this is Fresh Waves. I'm your host, Bren Masson. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Hi, this is Bren Masson, host of Fresh Waves. April is Organ Donation Awareness Month in Canada, so we are bringing awareness to the airwaves with real-life stories of real organ donors 
Families who have made the difficult decision in moments of extreme tragedy to donate a loved one's organs and organ recipients themselves. Join us on Fresh Waves and go to BeADonor.ca and register to be a donor today. Today I'm going to try to change the world. We're back on Fresh Waves. I'm your host, Bren Masson, and today we're speaking with Jean-Paul Bernier, who actually I was introduced to by somebody who lives in Toronto, and now he's moved to Montreal. And how fitting to have a name like Jean-Paul Bernier when you live in the good old de Provence de Quebec, huh? That's a perfect name. You don't have to be John Smith. You are fitting in quite perfectly. <laughs> So, you started out this conversation by telling us a little bit about your past history, and one of the things you mentioned is that you played volleyball. Yes. So, how well, seriously actually, did you take the volleyball thing? Well, um, when I graduated from university in 1980, I moved to Toronto and came out, because, you know, like, I mean, you're not going to come out when you're in Lakehead University in Thunder Bay, Ontario in 1980, like, if you put that in your back pocket. Yes, and that's true. you so I came out and, you know, you're sort of your big city, you're from, you're from a smaller town, you really don't know anybody. I hated the bar scene. It was just like, you know, you just feel completely inadequate. But I started going to the Y and they had a volleyball league and I'm going, why don't I start a gay volleyball league? So I uh, got together with a bunch of guys and we actually started a gay volleyball league and, um, Things went great. I also started a gay tennis league in Toronto, which is still going like incredibly big. Um, and it's a really nice way to meet people because the, the focus is whatever you're doing. It's not like, oh, you know, what are you doing tonight type of thing. So um, it was a lot of fun. Uh, we uh, they reached out to us uh, when I say they the North American Gay Volleyball Association reached out to us a couple of years in and we started playing tournaments all over the United States uh, San Diego California Florida a lot of the Midwestern states New York you name it so in 1986 we put together a volleyball team and we went to the Gay Games in San Francisco. And the team from Toronto, that this little Canadian team, actually won the gold medal. Wow! <laughs> well, congratulations! <laughs> Yay! I know. It was it was a little because there were like thousands of people there watching. I thought it was just going to be like we'd been to other tournaments. It's pretty much just the only people who were involved in the tournament are there. But there there were like thousands of people watching. So that was. A lot of fun. And then in 1990, we went to Vancouver and we won the bronze medal. And it's a revolving group of teams. So like, and I played uh, 1994 in New York City, 1998 in Amsterdam. We won the silver medal there. And my last gay games was in 2002 in Sydney. Wow. So I always joke, it took me like 24 years to get the three medals, but I did. Um, so uh, it is fair to say then that you were in amazing shape because you are playing all the time practicing all the time you're you know when you live that lifestyle you tend to be eating well and taking care of yourself to a certain point because your passion is your sport right yeah but you know what happens is genetics comes along and bites you in the butt yeah if I had taken the time to actually sit down with my family and talk to them about the circumstances of my family and how they passed away, and the males passed away quite early, genetically, we are we are apt to have heart problems, um, glaucoma, this sort of thing. So, mm-hmm. yeah, genetics... It Genetics was with me because I, you beat yourself up too when it happens. To you. What did I do wrong? What did I do? I was doing all these things right. And, you know, your cardiologist sort of grabs you and says, no, dumbass. It was genetics. Yeah. So, yeah. So, and then of course, when you start looking into it, you know, with my older siblings, they're going, oh, yes, of course, you know, dad died of this, you know, your uncle died of this, granddad, granddad, granddad died of this. 
So actually, I think uh, the record is my father so far. He lived to 73. Everybody else has sort of croaked before then due to heart disease. So Wow. I know. So, um, yeah, it is genetics, and then there's nothing you can do about that. It's not You're predetermined almost. I, well, exactly. But, you know, and uh, honestly, I've got to be honest as far as eating properly of course you know you're 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 going to the gym every day you're playing volleyball you're playing tennis you're downhill skiing you're having a great old time so you think oh what the hell i can have foie gras mm. <laughs> oh i love foie gras <laughs> well, and which is basically what my my cardiologists have told me they're saying basically if it's good for you you can't have it <laughs> I mean, if it tastes good, you can't have it. Because yeah. It's not good for you. So, like, you know, I've, I've learned to um, thank God for my, my husband. He's the one who's going, no, you're going to have a salad with every meal type of thing. So, Yeah, you learn to love quinoa and avocados. <laughs> Yuck. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or even entertain the idea of going be- vegetarian. But I'm going, I haven't gone that far yet. No. No, no. Well, you know what? Like you said, you can beat yourself up about it or you can just say that, you know, a lot of people who are living a very athletic life can't afford to eat some of the more luxurious food, so to speak. And they don't, their bodies deal with it. But if you have a genetic condition, your body's saying, no, no, no. Exactly. And there's nothing you can do about it. Exactly. So now, I, now what are you doing now that you've had a transplant? Are you back playing volleyball? No. What, what, what happened was from playing so much sports, I completely wrecked my knees. So, like, I've got arthritis in both my knees. I go to the gym every day to build up the supporting muscles mm-hmm. so that I don't have to get cortisone injections or entertain having a, a knee replacement, which, by the way, they've got down to an art form now, so good for them. Mm-hmm. So, if the, you know, that's a card up my sleeve if I need to entertain that at some point. But, um, no, so, like, I, I'm limiting my cardio to a stationary bike. Uh, at the gym, um, as far as sports are concerned, um, really not a lot of sports, just like going to the gym, building up, making sure, you know, I'm exercising my muscles, uh, doing a lot of stretching, a lot of cardio. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're leaving for Europe this summer. We're going to Portugal and Spain. Oh, me so too. I'm going to actually get a trainer to show me how to do calisthenics for, gen- uh, uh, for geriatrics. <laughs> <laughs> so I can sort of kind of stay in shape when I'm, when I'm, when I'm traveling. I hope you have a trainer that's over the age of 35. Um, I, find- I don't know who it is. His name, I haven't met him yet. I've got it set up. His name's Axel. Oh my. <laughs> so, no, <laughs> I'm expecting to see some guy with a mullet. Like, <laughs> Yeah. But you know, it's funny because my mom is a yoga teacher. She taught yoga till she was 85 years old and then she figured it was wow. time for someone else to teach. But um, during that time, I, as a young person, would see her, the people that were in her yoga class, and this was when yoga wasn't even cool. And I would think to myself, oh, my God, if I can't sit cross-legged, just shoot me. And, you know, because at 25, you cannot relate to 55 no matter how you try. Exactly. So it's always nice to have a trainer that's a little older and can relate at least to some of the things you're going through so that they can advise you. I love it when they say, oh, no, you just use this TheraBand, this one, (laughs) the one that it takes two elephants to pull, and you just pull on it every day. (laughs) <laughs> okay. <laughs> sure. <laughs> anyway. Anyway, good luck with that. Good luck. I hope it I hope it all works out because you know, I think once you've been active like that when you're younger, you 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 like that kind of activity in your life. I'm telling you, you get addicted to it. Like if I don't go to the gym, I feel like crap. Mhm. Yeah. Um Now with your and, transplant, and- do you notice like you do you notice that you're performing as well as you thought you would, not as well as you thought you would? I think that I, I think I'm, tr- I'm tr- performing better than I ever thought I would. Wow. Um, because you have to remember from 2005 until 2018, I was dragging my body around with a half to one third of a heart missing. Yeah. So, 
And then, you know, yes, I'm going to go to the gym every day and because I can. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that great? You know, I can do it now. I don't have to worry about, you know, the defibrillator firing or running out of breath or so. Um, yeah, it's like. Have you, uh, sorry, have you ever tried to get a hold of your donor or the donor's family? Uh, you know, they, I wrote them a letter. When you, they actually give you a pamphlet, and they tell you what you can say in the letter. Mm-hmm. So you can be thankful, but you can't give any indications as to, like I can say I worked in education, I worked with young people, This, how it's changed my life, um, how thankful you are, but you can't say my name is Jean-Paul Bernier and, you know, blah, blah, blah. So Right, and you give that wrote, letter to the Trillium Foundation, correct? You do, yeah. and they in turn forward it on to the family. Right. Um, I have no idea who this person is that gave me this heart. I just, um, I want to, you know, you thank the family. I, I've heard that they can reach out. I don't know if I want to reach out. I, I think I would leave that up to the donor's family to reach out mm-hmm. because they may not want to be, they may, that's a scar. Like, do you really want to? Or maybe they would be happy to hear from me seeing how wonderful my life is now. I right. don't know. It's hard to say, but it's it's um, it's nice that you have the opportunity through Trillium to at least send a letter that you know Trillium will get to the donor family so exactly. that they know that you are thankful for the gift. Exactly. Um, but my, my friends were joking, apparently, at, there was in the paper at that point some fireman who had passed in in the city and he donated his organs to their so you know they're going oh you got the organs of some fireman and I'm going oh, come on do you <laughs> really like so um, yeah it's at least I got to say thank you exactly. and you know you can uh, how much can you put in a letter you know what I mean but. I think maybe the best letter I can write is just be the best I can every day and make the most out of my life. Mm-hmm. Well, um, and you, you feel that innately, don't you? It's not like you have to wake up and remind yourself. No, no, that's just something that you feel innately. Um, and I, I remember as well, there was, um, they give, they give you, which was interesting after directly after the transplant, they get they're put you out, you're on prednisone. It's a, it's a steroid, Mm -hmm. but prednisone has a nasty little side effect that it can induce diabetes. So I actually was a diabetic for six months. Um, having to take my blood sugars and inject myself in the morning uh, and they would, you know, gradually wean me off like in milli milliliters of prednisone and decreased the amount of insulin that I was taking as well to the point where, and they kept reassuring me, oh, you're not a, you're not a, you're not a diabetic, you're not a diabetic. Um, but this is, you know, as soon as the prednisone was gone, then, then the diabetes was gone. But oh, that's good. Yeah. But it's still like, you know, it's, it was something we're going, oh, what now type of thing. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. But you're here and you're talking I- to us and we are so happy to have you on the show today. Um, and, and thank you for taking part in our organ donation awareness show because I think people need to hear from people like you to realize that organ donation can give somebody their life back. Hey, well, they give their life back and give their, 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 all the people who are connected to that person, their, another lease on life as well. Like I think mm-hmm. um, I've been pretty inspiring for my siblings. You know, we're all getting to the same age. We're all entertaining health issues. Um, and, you know, we have this Facebook family page that we're on every day. And it's like, we check each other, you know what I mean? Like, Oh, you start feeling sorry for yourself or what do you mean? What are you doing? Like what you're eating all this fatty food. Shouldn't be doing that. Uh, and uh, you know, that, I've got one sibling who tends to sort of feel sorry for themselves and sort of like, Oh, how can you be like that? Look at JP, like, you know, that, this, that, and the next thing. So yeah, that's JP is my sort of pet name. Yes. Yes. 
Well, yeah, so. you know, a lot of people say bad things about social media, and there are a lot of downsides to social media. But the connection side of social media, I think, is second to none. It's such a a nice place to be in a world where we can all check in with each other through different avenues of social media. I think it's wonderful. Exactly, and like friends as well. Like I, we've like I like I said, I just moved from Toronto. I spent forty two years of my life there after graduating. Um. And we've since moved to Montreal, but with social media, I can, you know, there, I've got this woman in my neighborhood, uh, Diane, who's living on her own still in her own house. And she's 77 and she does tend to say, oh, well, you know, I feel, especially if COVID was hard on older people, mm-hmm. especially if the grandchildren got were at school then the parents are uncomfortable about having the children around the grandparents so she could see them, but only through the window type of thing. Um, but, you know, I would be getting her out every day for when I was recovering as well. Come on, let's go for our walk around the block type of thing. That's um, wonderful. And yes, for the exercise, but more for the social interaction. Mm-hmm. Get out there. There's like, there's, there's a whole neighborhood of people and, there's this other inspiring woman in my in my neighborhood, uh, Betty, 88 years old, still living by herself, yep. walking around the neighborhood, managing just fine. Thank you. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, you know, during COVID, this is totally off topic, but I must say, during COVID, we were all trying to be so considerate. Well, I was anyway of of the other people around transplant people who are so vulnerable. Wear your damn mask. Not if you even if you don't believe in it, just so you can protect them. If there's any if there's any truth to the fact that the masks work, do it to protect the person who's vulnerable. And my mom was 93. My aunt was 99. And um, I said I was canceling Christmas. And then I changed my mind. I said, I'm not going to cancel Christmas. I'm going to postpone Christmas indefinitely until we can to meet. And my, at the time she was 97 and she said to me, the only thing I live for is the family get togethers. If you cancel those, you might as well kill me now anyway. So I don't care if it's going to be my last Christmas. I want to see everyone. This is what I live for. And I thought, okay, Christmas is in March. On we go, folks. That's right. And you know what? Everybody rapid tests before they, they, they know you shouldn't do that. You're supposed to use the rapid test only if you're starting to feel a little ill or whatever. But the fact of the matter is if you have older uh, transplant patients who are family or whatever, you rapid test before you become, before you come into contact with them to make sure that that little extra layer of precaution to make sure that you're not exposing them to anything. Exactly. Um, yeah. So, and then we also yeah. have to take into account that some of the older people are quite capable of making up their own minds of what they're willing to risk. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I have uh, this friend of mine, uh, Alyssa, she's brilliant. She's a, a psychologist and we, she was very helpful during COVID because, you know, you with me and my, my situation. She goes, we would go for walks and I'd be walking, you know, four feet away from her. And she's going, we're outside. It doesn't matter. Like, you know, you're, we're not going to get it outside. You're not going to get it from passing somebody on the street. You're going to get it if you're in a room close to somebody. And basically what you're doing is risk assessment, constant <laughs> risk yes. assessment. Yes. Um, or um, when I went, I, I just came back, I went down to Cuba in February and, you know, the talk to, uh, before you do anything, you talk to your transplant team and the transplant team's like, yeah, sure, you can go, that's fine, but uh, wear a mask on the plane yeah, and wear a mask on the bus. Yeah. And when you're at the resort and you're lying poolside, you, you, of course, you don't have to wear a mask because you're not around anybody. Right. Yeah. So like, you know, life is certainly livable. It's just like, you just make adjustments. Yeah. And you just yeah. become aware and considerate for for those around you. I know some people on the transplant uh, roster who are still very, very, very careful because they say if they get, get called, sick, they take you off exactly. And if they get the call that their organ is is ready and here you go, and they say I've got COVID, it all it all falls apart. You know, well, exactly. And we well, have to, I think we have to be, as a society, respectful of that. 
Yeah, and, and you know, but it's just not transplant. Like I remember um, recently, uh, young children were very, very uh, susceptible, like infants susceptible to um, RVS or what's mm-hmm. that? But RVS and COVID and the flu. So, like, you know what? If I'm going to be around a young child, I'm going to put a mask on. Like, yeah. especially if I'm not feeling well, because I don't want. Like, it, can you imagine being that young and not being able to understand what's happening? Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. Exactly. We just do the best we can for those around us. I think when when people were getting their noses out of joint during COVID because they were being told what to do and all the social media hype that mm-hmm. we were hearing, I kept wanting to just put somewhere, what happens to your duty to society? What happens to your sense of community? Exactly. Think about this. Think about the people who you might be hurting. You don't want to be the one who causes them any pain. <laughs> well, that's my theory anyway. I don't know. Well, you know, and, and, and guilt is a wonderful thing. <laughs> Isn't it just? Isn't it so just? So I, I had a situation where I'd gone back to work and there was a secretary in my office who is an anti-masker and um, basically I said, you know, I, I really need you to wear a mask because I'm particularly susceptible. I'm taking these immune system suppression drugs and blah, blah, blah. And she got it, but I sort of guilted her into it. You know what I mean? <laughs> Good but, for you. <laughs> but I, I don't care at least like it, the, the other, the other part of the equation is what's going through my mind is somebody gave me their damn heart. I got to take care of it. Absolutely. So I'm going to use guilt and, and persuasion and everything, but if it comes right down to it, I'm just like, get away from me. Unless you're going to wear a mask, you know, you stay away from me. Like I have to take care of myself and take care of this gift. So. That's a wonderful, wonderful way of looking at it too, because I think that a lot of people, when they, when it, when they look at organ donation, they say, well, yeah, that's somebody else. Yeah, well, if I don't see them, then it doesn't affect me. And, you know, people are dying every day. If you don't know that person, then it doesn't affect you in the same way. But when you think that you can tune into a show like this or go to the transplant games or go to an organ donation awareness event and see all the fabulous people who are living life and doing wonderful things with the life that they've been given because someone registered to be an organ donor. It's a no-brainer. Exactly. Well, like, who wouldn't? Like, you know, you're gone anyways. Like, even if you're a religious person, your body is basically a vessel. What counts is, from a religious perspective, is your soul. And that's gone. Yep. So why not leave the good part <laughs> to somebody who's still here? Yeah. Someone who can use them and use them to their fullest potential. I mean, you do not have to be a rocket scientist. You do not have to have your name on a plaque somewhere in order to be a person worthy of an organ. You just have to be living a good life and appreciating every day. And like you said, walking down the sidewalk with a smile on your face and that smile is infectious Mm -hmm. and someone else who was having a miserable day or who wasn't paying attention is now paying attention. And they're they're smiling. That in itself makes your organ so worthwhile. I think every cleric in this country should be up in their pulpit this Sunday or Saturday and saying to their congregation, the most Christian thing you could ever, or Christian or the most wonderful thing you could ever do is is donate your organs. Absolutely. And a lot of them are. I mean, I know that the um, people from the Trillium Foundation have approached every single religious leader that there is in all the different facets. And... They've all said, yes, we believe in organ donation. So the old myths about, um, no, it's against my religion, are, are absolutely not true. Mm. You know, well, well, there's a friend of mine, Margot, blah, uh, Margot from high school. <laughs> and uh, she's Jewish. And she was, when I was in the hospital having my transplant, she actually came to Toronto to see me. She lives in Ottawa. Wow. But uh, they went to Jerusalem, and she actually put a note in the wall and stuck one underneath as well 
So I figure I got a local call to God <laughs> about getting me a heart. But we were talking about, you know, um, I, I believe in Judaism, you need to like um, have all your body parts when they bear when they bury you. But even rabbis now have said, no, you can donate your organs. Yes. You don't need, so you can give that to somebody else. You can give somebody else that gift of life. Yes. So, yeah, I just wish everybody would like, wake up. Yeah. So that's my last question for you on the show today is, if you had one thing to tell people in the world, what would it be now that you've had your heart and you're living a wonderful life? It doesn't really matter if you're somebody just on the street or if you're the the head of Warren Buffett or or Galen Weston, the greatest gift you can give to anybody is the chance at life or extending their life. Um, and not just if you don't like that young man from hum, uh, uh, from the humble Broncos, he helped 22 people yep. with his organ, do- organ donation. So it's like, your skin, your eyes, everything, and your body is a vessel. You die, that's gone. What matters is your soul. And I'm telling you, that soul has a lot better chance of getting to heaven <laughs> yep. if you do the right thing and donate those organs. Well said. Thank you. Thank you for that. Well, I've really enjoyed speaking with you this morning, Jean-Paul. And I wish you all the best. Have a wonderful time in Portugal and Spain. Depending on when you go, I might run into you on the street. (laughs) We're going to the north. So everybody tends to go to Lisbon and uh, and Barcelona. Right. We're going to Porto. Nice. So, yeah. Well, enjoy uh, your trip and enjoy your life. Uh, We've never met, but if you see some idiots smiling, that's probably me. Okay, great. (laughs) Thanks again for speaking to us on Fresh Waves. That's it, everybody. We have a wrap for today. If you'd like to hear this show again or any other Fresh Waves podcasts broadcast, just go to our YouTube channel, Fresh Waves Radio, and you'll find all of the past shows there. Have a great day, everyone, and we'll catch you again next week on Fresh Waves. 